Another one of my Twitter friends, uh, I love how the internet can like open up the world to these people you meet on Twitter and form this kind of like connection with. And then you're actually kind of able, I mean, I know we're not in person, but talking at least through Zoom. So John, my friend, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining me. Um, you do you do a lot of writing and a lot offer a lot of interesting thoughts and perspectives when it comes to mental health. Um, especially on Twitter. I know you have your, uh, your blog website, Writing the Ship. Um, I'll let you kind of set the scene for your story and how you got into sort of advocating and, and writing about it. Um, but just with, with whatever you're comfortable with, kind of like share your mental health story from the beginning to where we are now. Um, in a way, my... my story is odd in the sense that for a long time I didn't think it began before 2014. In mm. 2014 I attempted suicide um, and my writing, my uh, involvement with Twitter um, all happened after that. Um, and it's only recently that I've started to open myself up to my life prior to 2014. Um, I do have a blog post that touches on earlier events, but they're not things that I really explore. My blog itself, I started blogging so I could keep my son in the loop. I wanted him to be aware of what I was doing to help myself get better. Um, texting didn't give enough information for him. Um, and it also didn't create a forum for me to properly explain all that I was doing. So I, I wanted to write. And it was basically just a way for him and I to, to communicate. He suggested I go on Twitter. And at the beginning of 2015, I saw my first Bell Let's Talk commercial on TV. Mm. I didn't know that campaign existed before that. And when Bell Let's Talk Day came up, I was all in 100%. And was shocked when I saw things that I was sharing get retweeted. I didn't think anybody was reading my stuff. I had a following at that time of maybe one, my son. <laughs> so I didn't expect anybody to be taking notice. Um, and that account, which I had under the handle Z Zalandroid009, grew tremendously. I found as it grew, it was becoming a problem for me because I thought I had an expectation to live up to, mm -hmm. and I wasn't ready to do that. I also found that my blog um, was having some technical issues. I, I had a free domain name, I had a free domain host, uh, but people were reading and I was starting to get into the limits of the free availability. So I formed Writing the Ship, um, closed my old Twitter account and started fresh to have um, more control over what I wanted to say and not have to meet uh, the expectations being mm -hmm. imposed upon. That's so fun. 2015, Bellet's Talk Day. That's the first time I shared my story publicly. Um, maybe there's something in the air. <laughs> <laughs> that That is very, I didn't have the blog, but that is very similar that I first shared my story. I just got inspired. I knew what Bellet's Talk Day was a little bit before then. But I mean, I, I kind of participated like everyone else did, right? Like 
retweet a few things like it's okay to be okay like that type of like this the very generic vanilla kind of mental health comments and then I again I don't know what it was about that day in particular but I just saw people's stories and I was like you know what I'm just going to share a little bit about mine and the same thing the the retweets the people who were commenting the people who were sending me messages like it was all, it was overwhelming in a mostly positive way, but like similar to, I was just like, wow, I can't believe that this tweet that I like half thought through all of a sudden had this impact. Is that kind of what you were feeling as well? I had one tweet and for the life of me, I cannot remember what I said. Um, but I, I went, and I guess as often happens on, on, on social media, you hit that right point in time where someone sees it and it just explodes. Yeah. Um, and that happened with, with one of my tweets that day. And it shocked me. Um, I got all kinds of DMs that flowed from that. And it was beyond my ability to deal with. Uh, keep in mind, and for context, that my suicide attempt was in late 2014. So when this was going on, uh, I was still very raw mm -hmm. uh, with my emotions, still very raw with the experience I had just gone through. Um, and so this inundation of stuff um, I shut down mm. and, and, and I, I took a pause. Um, and then one DM stood out and, and I write about that in my blog. Um, the person identified themselves as nobody. So clearly they wanted to be anonymous and I respected that, uh, but talk about how my tweets of that day uh, made an impact that I was saying things that they wish they could say, but they didn't feel able to do that. Uh, and, and that was extremely eye opening in a different way. Uh, I mean, it showed me um, the power of the written word and the, the power of openness and the power of, of honesty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that like, you know, you and I, especially very involved in the the Twitter mental health community, you know, there's a lot of people in that community. And that's so wonderful. It's so great to connect with so many people from, you know, all over, I mean, the world in a lot of cases, but especially North America, who share the same mission and values, but all come from different backgrounds and different experiences. And um, that's all very interesting. But the amount of people who who are, who are reading, who might reach out, but they're, they're not necessarily tweeting all the stuff out themselves, but they're reading almost everything everybody's saying. Um, that number is unquantified right now, but it's massive. And I think, I know for myself, I forget that a lot. I forget that I'm like, oh, that tweet only had, you know, two likes and a retweet. Like, oh, that's not been very good. But I always forget the amount of people who just or reading these things being like, wow, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. And in that moment where we think in our brains that, you know, we're the only one in the world feeling this, it, it, it's morbid. I always say it's morbid, but it is powerful that, you know, you're not alone and the only person thinking the same way, no matter how strange or weird or dark it might be, you know? Yeah. Um I, I agree with that. Um, there's a lot of people who say, reach out, reach out, reach out, reach out. We hear that all the time. And it's valuable and important advice. But I, I think for that to happen, there needs to be two other components. One is a connection with someone. Uh, and that happens because of sharing. Mm. They have seen something in what you have shared that they can connect with, that they can say, yes, I, I, I understand that. 
Uh, and then is listening. And uh, that's where I think the DM function in Twitter is, is so valuable because that gives you that chance to have someone connect with you and share, and you can listen to what they have to say um, and give them that forum because that may be the first time that they have done that. And, and that's so important to give respect to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and it's important too, for those listening that if you have the capacity and you see someone struggling, maybe it's through a tweet or in your personal life, that it's okay for you to reach out to them. I know a lot of times for myself when I'm, when I'm struggling or when I'm in a depressive episode, even with everything I know about mental health, it's still really hard for me to reach out and ask for help. Uh, because like, I get that feeling of being a burden. I'm like, I don't want to burden someone else. They have a lot going on. We're in a pandemic. Like why add my struggles to their, their plate, you know? And then I, I always have to try to catch myself and be mindful that like, no, like these people support me, they love me and they will be there for me. Yeah. Um, I'm slightly different only in the mm. sense that I don't now see myself as a burden. Um, I, I've gotten past that point. Um, what I see for myself is opening a door for somebody else uh, by sharing my story um, it allows somebody else to see a path that they may be able to follow or more importantly to find that there are paths that exist in the first place mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we both know about depression is that you don't see outside of the illness it, 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 you're caught so much in the darkness that you don't see a way out. And, and that's what sharing that we both do gives. It gives somebody um, an opportunity to see that, yes, there is a way. And in fact, many ways. Mm -hmm. All they need is perhaps a little bit of guidance. Mm -hmm. You have this wonderful self-care plan. It's, uh, it's featured on your website, um, Writing the Ship. Uh, dot ta uh, writing as in right uh, you're right um, with the r it's also on unsinkable and we're going to get into that but i'm curious to know because there is we there's an age difference between us uh, and i'm always curious because you come from a you know a different generation that really didn't talk about mental health or illness or understand it even more so than me as a millennial did so leading up to that point of 2014, like, did you know something was wrong? Did you, like, were you trying to seek help before that? Um, were you aware of mental illness, mental health, and all those things uh, as you were, or was it more like a gradual thing and you didn't even realize it until you were in crisis? Mm -hmm. The, the blunt answer is no. Mm. Uh, as, as you mentioned, my generation, the uh, mental illness was something that was hidden in the closet. It wasn't talked about. Uh, so I had no understanding of what illnesses existed, what the symptoms were. So I had no way of knowing that I was ill. Uh, my illness is bipolar too. Um, and bipolar two has two main components it has hypomania mm. and that's periods where I feel exceedingly confident. Um, my writing comes well-formed and structured and glorious. <laughs> and then there's the depressive side and with bipolar two, depressive episodes are the predominant feature. You spend a lot of time in depressive episodes. But that was the pattern of my life, alternating between these two states of being. And because that was the pattern of my life, I did not know 
that wasn't what everybody else felt. Mm. I thought that was just the way it was. Mm. That changed in September of 2014. And it changed not on the day of my suicide attempt, but on the day when I woke up in the hospital still alive. That's when I realized there was a problem. I didn't know what the problem was, but I knew at that point there was an issue that I had to find a solution for. A counselor at the hospital came to my hospital bed and talked and asked questions. And I didn't know the answers because I was still very much as I mentioned earlier, raw. Um, but two words were mentioned by that counselor that I captured. One of them was mindfulness, which I had no idea what it was. And the other one was depression. Um, and what began at that point was research to find out what these things were. And in depression, I saw parts of what I had gone through. Only parts because it didn't talk about the hypomania, mm -hmm. the other side of my moods. Um, but I saw part of me. And, and so I saw um, that there now was something that I could work on to help you. Mindfulness gave me a way out of the noise in my head. It allowed me an opportunity to let those thoughts just be thoughts and let those thoughts go. Now, it took a long time mm -hmm. for me to develop those skills. And you understand that yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where the root of illness was first apparent. Um, and what I've done is taken a lot of my learning and created a plan that I turn to, to help me when I feel off. Mm. I remember talking about mindfulness last year with um, Dr. Rachel Linval and uh, Aaron McLeod, who's a, an Olympic soccer player, um, and talking about mindfulness. And one of the things I, I always kind of chuckle about is like mindfulness is one of those like buzzwords people love to throw around. And they're like, okay, yeah, let's, let's practice mindfulness. And it's like, okay, yeah, 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 I'll try that. And it's like, okay, what is it? What does that actually mean? And one thing that you brought up, which is, is extremely important and like not enough people realize is it takes practice. You practice mindfulness. It's not like you're just gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna try mindfulness. And when you're sad or depressed or anxious or whatever, you're just like, it, it doesn't work. You're like, well, mindfulness doesn't work for me, right? It's, it's, it's a practice. It's an ongoing pattern of behaviors and, and thoughts to try to manage whatever moment you're in and bring you back to the present. So how do you practice mindfulness uh, and how does it work for you? Um, like most people who are dealing with their mental illness, you develop uh, your own coping skills. Um, and one of the ones that I developed for myself is, is a mindful coffee. Hmm. And, and what I do when I'm making coffee in the morning is, is I've turned that whole thing into a mindful exercise. So it begins with the sound of the water flowing from the tap. And, and I allow myself to immerse myself in that sound. <clears throat> I watch the play of the light on the water as it flows. Um, I listen to the sound of the water going into the pot. When I take the lid off the coffee, I allow the aroma uh, to, to build. Uh, and, I, and I spend moments with each of these different sensations to give them their space 
at a time. Um, so I've slowed the whole exercise down. As the coffee brews, of course, to get the aroma of the coffee uh, throughout the room. And, and so I have the anticipation of it. Um, then when I add the cream, I watch the mixture of the colors. Um, I don't stir my coffee. I allow uh, the mix to happen naturally. And if it's fully mixed or not, that doesn't matter to me. It's, it's what is meant to be naturally. Hmm. Um, and so I'm totally in that moment. That is um, exclusive of anything else around me. I devote it to that exercise. And I do that each morning. Throughout the day, I will have uh, pauses. I will take the time to breathe, um, to look at my thoughts, uh, to be aware of where my thoughts are at that moment in time and what's going on around me that may have caused those thoughts to appear. And then I will move on in a mindful way, just more in tune with the present moment. Um, that I found out is what in DBT is called the stop practice. Mm. I didn't know that. I found that out uh, in these past few months. But, um, so those are the things that I do when I go for a walk. Um, I will slow my pace down and become more aware of the movement of my limbs, um, the synchronization with my arm and my legs as I'm moving down the path, uh, the sensation of my muscles, my knees at my age creaking more than I want them to, um, the sounds and, and that I may hear around me or birds, wind chimes, the, the sensation of the wind blowing. Um, so I try and, and take that simple uh, exercise and, and make it something uh, more now centered. Mm. Yeah, it, um, that's, that's the point of it, right? For those listening who's unfamiliar with mindfulness, it's, it's being present. It's recognizing everything that's happening in that moment with you and not letting you yourself drift too far ahead or too far back it's it's consciously trying to just acknowledge everything around you which is very calming to the brain well, there's lots of science to back that up so let's talk about this self-care plan um so you, obviously mindfulness is a part of that and you have your morning routine was this like how long did it take to develop this i am very much of the mindset is i listen to a lot of different pieces of advice because it works differently for everybody. Not everyone's going to have the same self-care plan. And I, I go, okay, well, let's try this. And we'll see if it works for a bit. We try it for a week or two. Are we feeling better, feeling worse? Does it feel like a nuisance? And then I, I kind of just add bits and pieces uh, and I've, I've developed kind of this, this thing that works for me. Was it a similar process for you? Was it something that was developed over time? Was it something you maybe worked with a therapist and like wrote it down on a piece of paper and you're like, this is what's going to, what's going to happen. It happened very naturally in that moment is a little bit of both. How did you come to develop this and maybe how long did it take? Cause I think a lot of people think, Oh, it's something immediate that happens. It's something that I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write it out and then we're going to follow it. I'm going to hopefully feel better. Like, you know what I mean? So what was the process like for you? Um, it began with a safety plan. Mm. Um, I used the services of my local CMHA uh, and my team lead and I sat down and created the safety plan. Mm. That was done at my request. I felt that my mental health was precarious enough that I wanted to have a guidance to support so that I could rely on. And so what we created was um, just a, a, a very simple step-by-step -step that I could follow. Stop and breathe, 
uh, relax. Uh, it, active distractions, passive distractions, and then a list of uh, safety numbers that I could call based on the level of discomfort I was experiencing. And, and that was it. It was, it was that simple. The important part, of course, was the telephone numbers that were there. Um, and, and that's what I needed. Then I started to learn new skills. I was doing my own research and, and finding out about CBT and CBT templates. Um, I was finding apps online that had thought records and uh, paste breathing tools and all of this stuff. Um, and I realized that this safety plan in a way was self-limiting. The nature of it meant that I would only turn to it when I felt myself to be unsafe. Mm. And because it was that, these other tools that I was learning were not being reflected in the plan itself. Um, so I started to change the purpose of the plan. And ultimately it became my self-care plan. And it took about a year, mm. the initial plan that I had. But the idea was is to start with breathing, because it always starts with the breath. That's where you ground yourself and, and take a moment to uh, become aware of yourself. Uh, with breathing comes the beginning of relaxation. And it also gives you that pause where you can say, okay, what do I need to do next? And then you get into the passive distractions, TV, music, where you can sit and uh, I've got on my uh, Spotify playlists that depend on mood. Mm. Um, so if I need calming music, I've got a playlist for, for that purpose. Um, then there's the more active distractions, sitting down and having a five minute body scan meditation or a 20 minute body scan meditation, uh, going to uh, what I call my commentator, but this is really a wellness toolbox um, and, and things of that sort. Uh, and it's graduated so that as my level of discomfort grows and these tools don't accomplish the task of calming me, I then move on to the next one. Um, and it's done in a calm way. It, it gives me guidance. And because it's given me guidance, it's also given me comfort that, yes, you can manage this. It's not out of control. Mm. What I have added since that self-care plan first arose was a recognition of two things. One, that as my ability to manage has improved and I've learned new tools, I've evolved my plan. And it, it's now what I call a living document. It grows, it changes as I grow and change. Mm. Um, and, and so it's no longer um, just that safety plan that I started with. It, it's no longer that static document. It's now something that has vitality of its own. Um, and then the other thing is that um, I, I've started to share the tool um, so that other people can see the advantage in, again, going beyond the static document to, to have something that gives them more than just that. Mm -hmm. And by showing as I do uh, some of the tools that I use, I open the door for people to recognize that 
there are different tools that they can put in so that they can create the document uh, to suit their needs. So it's not necessarily like a item one, two, three, like, okay, start with this, then add this. And then it's more of like, you're going through it to see what's going to work. So you, you're trying one thing. So it's not like kind of like a consecutive, I'm going to start with this, then we add this, and then I'm going to add this. It's more of like a, what's helping in that moment, but you know, all these tools can kind of help based on kind of the situation and experience. Yeah. Um, what it is, because it's something that is growing with you, it's something that you refer to uh, on a more regular basis because you're, you're changing it, you're modifying it right. uh, to, to suit your own needs. And because you're more aware of it, um, you use it more. Uh, you don't wait until crisis, you use it earlier than crisis. Mm -hmm. And you tend, as I found at least for myself, you tend to go almost immediately to the process that you need at that time. So you innately know that passive distractions aren't going to cut it today. Today I need something more active, or I may need to call a crisis line. But that's because you are working with the plan on a more regular basis. Right. So you've kind of touched on it, but I know a lot of people are probably think of, thinking of it like it's it's great to have this plan that you can refer to when when you're struggling. But I think a lot of people and a lot of people who aren't necessarily in the mental health community who spend a lot of time with this stuff, excuse me, they we get busy, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe work is overwhelming. Maybe you're in a trouble with a friendship or relationship or you know, I think about the world right now, it's very overwhelming at times. And, and sometimes we, sometimes we can remember maybe this plan or something that might help. And then other times we get caught up in, in whatever's happening in our lives. And it can be hard to refer back to this, this plan, um, because it just kind of happens all so quickly. And we don't even realize it till it's kind of too late. So how did you or how do you recommend like making sure that it's not just something you practice when you think about it. It's more of like this, something that will like, how do you make it stick, you know? And especially when you really need it, how did you make it really, really stick? So you always have it and not only sometimes have it. At the beginning, it was because I wrote it down in multiple places. Mm. I printed it and made it available to see in multiple places. Um, I have it on my phone as a uh, Word document. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I've written about uh, the plan and the, the constant revision. Uh, as I'm learning new things, I'm revising it. All of those things keep it foremost in your mind. Um, and then there are times when I have had to use it. Uh, there are times when I've been in crisis and I've had to use it. There are times when I've not been in crisis, but I still use it because at the beginning are the simple tools the, the taking a moment to pause and breathe. Um, that is where all else with mental health begins is taking that time to pause and breathe. It won't solve things, but it gives you that moment to reflect. And because you have that moment to reflect, for me, that gives me that moment to say, ah, yes, I have this tool that I can now use. Right. It, uh, it, it stops that fight or flight response to that, that breath, right? Like you said, it grounds you. And yes. uh, especially in like an anxious moment when your heart's racing, it just it, like it's scientifically proven. It relaxes your brain and your body because it doesn't think that, you know, you're in an urgent situation anymore. 
Here's what I'm curious about. And, and you know me, I talk a lot about masculinity and men. And I know we've chatted about this before when we were on a call with uh, Unsinkable together. When we're talking about these things like meditation, um, some of these practices you use, how long, like, did it take you a long time to, to embrace these ideas, especially because as men, it seems kind of cringy. It seems it's very like uncomfortable in a way. I know I feel that way sometimes when I'm practicing it, like, oh, this is, it's silly, right? Like, oh, if anyone saw me or knew I was doing this, it seems silly, even though it's not. Did you, did you feel that like when you were trying to embrace it as a practice that it's very uncomfortable and hard to like get yourself into this, this state of being where you could accept it? Yes. Because, <laughs> like, I think, like, if I'm like, Dad, like, you should meditate. Like, he'd be like, bro, oh, no, I don't need that. Like, you know, like, it, it's a mindset if, thing. Yeah, if you have watched me mindful walking, that mindful walking is odd to see. <laughs> um, so the answer is yes, it, it is odd. Um, it does sometimes seem unnatural to me. Um, it doesn't seem masculine at all mm. in the stereotype of masculinity that I grew up with. But when I woke up in the hospital, something had to change. And, and I woke up with that realization, very strong realization that what had gone on before clearly had not worked. Um, and so I was open to change. Mm. I've researched as much as I can, and, and I'm now at a point where I'm looking for more um, structured care. But mindfulness I, I i i didn't just jump into it I, I read books i watched youtube videos from uh, psychologists and psychiatrists explaining what it was and talking about the science behind it um so i i, I did that type of research um so i kind of sold the idea to myself mm. um and you know what, if, if, if all these guys are saying how beneficial it is, who am I to say it's not? Yeah, it is weird that the, I don't know, like all that stuff, like it just, like it, it feel like the way we've been taught that it is very um, feminine, I guess you could say, to to practice meditation and, and the mindfulness and like you said, the mindful walk and all those different kind of like self-healing practices that there's, you know, this, and especially I think for someone of, of your age, that's why I was wondering just to get past that because, you know, I can't picture my dad or grandpa embracing that. And my, my dad's very open. It's not that he's not, but it's just this idea that some older gentlemen have about all this stuff. Like it's like very hippie. It's very, like a uh, tree hugger, like whatever word you want to use that you were able to embrace it, I think is like pretty remarkable because the, I wish I remember this, the, the article I was reading, um, but it was by a psychologist and it was basically like after the age of, like when your brain kind of stops fully developing. So 25, 27, 30 in that range to change your perspective and to learn something new is incredibly difficult to do. Um, you really have to put active work into it. It doesn't just happen as much as when you're younger, you could like listen to a podcast or read an article and your whole perspective on the world changes. It's very, you're kind of more grounded in your ideas. So for you to be able to do that and have that light bulb moment, even unfortunately that it was after a moment of crisis in your life is, is pretty remarkable that you're able to embrace it like that. I, I agree with you in a way, uh, mm -hmm. but in another way, it was 
a reflection of myself. Um, I always learn. I, I've never stopped learning. Uh, and so this was me just learning something else. And, and, and because I've always been open to learning um, and attaching to that my recognition that something dire needed to be changed, um, I was open to anything that was going to help me heal. And I've been fortunate to find the tools that I have. Um, but I have no choice. Mm -hmm. if, if I hadn't embraced these things, I would be back where I had been before I awakened. And I was not going to go back there. I know this is a deep question um, and feel free to skip it if you want, but without this, do you feel like you would still be here? No. No. Um, in 2000, Eighteen or 2019, I can't remember the exact year now, um, I was on vacation in Australia. My brother is quite ill. Um, and my mom wanted to go and lend him some support, but she was unable to travel by herself. So she asked me to assist. As part of that trip, I had a small side trip on my own to Sydney. Um, and I became extremely hypomanic. Mm. And it was frightening. I have never been as afraid as I was during that period of time. Um, I could feel myself edging ever closer to an abyss. And I was fortunate that I was able to pull myself back. Just. And, that, and that's when I'm supposed to be feeling my best. Mm -hmm. When I'm feeling my worst, um, the darkness is quite heavy, um, quite grim, quite bleak. Um, and I know where that took me. So when I've got both sides of my mood that can lead to a similar end, I'm firmly convinced that it's only the tools that I've gained that, that have given me uh, grounding and a foothold in life. Just a quick aside, if you don't mind, but I'm just curious because I, I haven't had a chance to talk to a lot of people about um, bipolar disorder. Um, when you are experiencing a hypomanic episode or maybe a major depressive episode, are they always followed by each other? Like, is it always super high than low? Or is it more like you might be high for a while, you'll kind of feel normal, might go high, like it's more unpredictable or it's like, is it always like when you're super high, it's like kind of like you'll know that, well, it's only a matter of time before I feel like super low. Is it either one or the other? Like, is there no normal at all? Like, how does it kind of like work? With bipolar two, which is my condition, as I mentioned earlier, the predominant mood is depression. Okay. Um, that's... And it's because that's the predominant mood that bipolar two has been elevated in um, the severity factor. It used to be considered the lesser bipolar. Mm. Um, but as, as doctors became more aware of just how much you were in depression, this idea of it being lesser has gone by the wayside. It's now 
recognized as dangerous as bipolar one. Uh, I'll give you an example. Well, let me describe my year for you. Sure. January of this year, I started off depressed. Started reaching out to various support agencies to get help. February, I was having significant side effects to medication. Uh, was rapidly taken off that medication uh, within weeks. It should have been over many months. It was done within weeks. That bumped me immediately into hypomania. A new drug was introduced. It took months to reach um, the pharmaceutical level, treatment level. Um, when it did, I then slid into a rapid cycling mixed episode. So every day I was going from depression to hypomania to depression to hypomania. That lasted several months. Oh my God. Another side effect, and, and, and this is part of, of, of the unfortunate part of medication is, is you don't know how it's going to affect you until you take it. Uh, but side effects meant another drug change. Um, and slowly, the rapid cycling mixed episode faded away, and it became a depressive episode again. The good news is that that depressive episode is stable. So I'm not having the, the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I'm now in a, a stable thing, and I'm not spiraling down. So that tells me that the medications are working to stabilize, but maybe they need to be bumped up slightly so I'm no longer depressed. Um, but no pattern to any of it. Um, and it's been an exhausting year. I was going to, hearing that like just sounds in not only just difficult because you're managing all these things, but just like exhausting, like just like I couldn't imagine, especially when you're talking about every day that it's like, I don't know how you don't just sleep. I guess <laughs> because of the hypomania. <laughs> well, I would wake up hypomanic, energized, ready for my day. And then I could feel my body and my mind just get drained. And that's when the depression was, was coming in. Um, and, and, and what happened is, of course, one of my medications um, that I took was at supper time. Um, and that then bumped me back into that hypomania again. So it, it, it was interesting. I I'd never experienced it before. Um, I hope not to again because yeah. it is exhausting. And my my sympathy for anybody who's going through it, but it, it is not an easy circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of finish off here, um, what advice, recommendations would you give to somebody who maybe is listening to this episode, sees it on social media? and uh, is considering, okay, maybe I should sit down and really start like a self-care plan. What would you recommend? Where do like people start and how do they, they add to it? Like what, what sorts of things would you recommend? There are three things that occurred to me on that. Uh, first one is there's a wonderful app called Be Safe. Um, and be safe allows you to create a safety plan. And, and I, I think a safety plan is, is valuable for anybody. Uh, be safe does have uh, elements in it where you identify where you're from. So it can then provide information about resources local to you. And be safe is also free. Um, and it's available both on Google and the App Store. So that, that's where I would start. Just 
create a safety plan for yourself. Um, I would then, not to boast, but take a look at what I've done um, why, and look at why I created the safety plan that I did. Um, I explain my reasoning and explain what I have done. Um, and, and you can use that as a template to structure your own plan. Uh, and then the third thing is always be open to exploring different treatments. One thing is not going to work all the time. Some days you're going to need to be more mindful than others. Some days you're going to need the exercise. Some days it may be sitting down coloring. Um, it's going to change as your mood changes, as your illness changes. Right. Um, we will, if you go to the episode notes as you're listening to this, um, there'll be a link to his self-care plan so you can check it out uh, handy dandily uh and uh get all the resources and everything um it's very much it's a very it's a it's a great kind of um like you take it right through it like there's seeking help next level distractions level like it's the plan is very broken down and it's wonderful so i mean thank you for uh helping people and writing it out in that level of detail because uh, that also takes a lot of time and work one of the things that I've, I've always thought since I started to heal is that it's incumbent to share what you learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, people on Twitter have shared with me. I share back. That is how we all grow. That is how we all um, benefit each other. And, and I learned very early on that the importance of sharing. I'm a man. Men like to keep things bottled up. We don't share. Uh, we don't want to be in touch with our emotions. Um, and I think because of those cultural stereotypes, it's important to show that yes, this man does share this man does share his emotions. Um, and here is how doing that has benefited him. Um, and and I, I, I take some pride in being able to do that. Uh, and I'm glad I do. Yeah, and I'm glad you do as well, because uh, it's a tremendous resource. Um, if people want to find you read some of your blogs uh what's your website what's your social media where can people get more information uh, the blog is at writing the ship all one word dot ca uh, i'm on twitter at at writing the shi one i don't know why they changed the p to a one but they do <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh john um i really appreciate uh this level of depth and insight that you've provided i think it's extremely helpful for a lot of people and maybe a lot of people who are struggling but aren't necessarily willing to share that struggle on social media. They suffer more to themselves and with their immediate support group. And I think it's a, a great resource, like I said. So again, thank you for reaching out. Thank you for writing this out and uh, sharing it here today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, I appreciate the time. Bum, bum, bum.